Good morning again. Morning, morning. Good, good to be with you guys. Good to worship and be a part of baptism to celebrate with Brooke and this new new decision in Christ is always exciting. We'll have her come back up. She loves standing in front of people, so she's really excited about it. <laughs> but it is so good to worship with, with each and every one of you guys. And as you see, we're in a, a new sermon series. My sermon series are getting a little shorter than all of last year, pretty much. But I, I may have adapted an existing logo, if you're familiar. Uh, but we made it work. It made it work. So <laughs> it is, it's a kind of a, if you want to say, a continuation or an offshoot from where we were the previous five weeks. If you're with us over any of those weeks, we went through the five solas. If you say, I have no idea what that is, it's a summation of the Reformation. And really, as we went through each one, we looked at what I've called the non-negotiables of our faith. What is it that we believe in? What is the foundation as Christians? Not just access point, but if I am a disciple of Christ, a follower of Christ, what are the issues that I'm not backing down on? And those were, as again, has been summarized from the reformers, from that early shift within the Protestant movement, the Reformation movement, you know, what we've learned through church history, and then brought together in this beautiful lift we, uh, list we call the solace, it reestablishes, reconnects us with what truly does matter. It was Christ alone, or Scripture alone, Christ alone, grace and faith alone, all to the glory of God alone. You know, these five solas remind us where our faith should be grounded. Everything through the litmus test of Scripture and Scripture alone. We can read other sources. We can glean other aspects from other theologians, pastors, individuals. But everything tested through Scripture. And because all of Scripture points to Christ, understand that the ultimate authority is Christ alone. And where our salvation rests is through grace and faith alone. And everything that we do, the decisions we make, we have to ask, is this to the glory of God alone? Again, these are the key elements that we must remain centered on as believers, as, again, access point, but also all believers, the, the church, the body of Christ as a whole. But the reason I wanted to have, again, an, an offshoot from those foundational elements, we obviously understand that among the foundational, the key elements of Christianity, there are many, many aspects of theology, different beliefs, different doctrines that are very off-center. Because, again, as a church throughout the years, we can look and see where we get off-center a little bit, get off of our foundation just, just a hair, and then off of that continues these branches, these, these offshoots that get further and further away from what really matters, and then is develop doctrines that really are nothing more than heresy. They are not biblical. They are not Christ-like, and they are not Christian. But the church, because it, it has a history, because of tradition, these things grow, become a part of church culture, and then it's passed off as if it's the Word of God. So while we have those solid biblical foundations, we also know that there are many beliefs out there, many within the Christian church, that are not centered on the foundation of Scripture alone, Christ alone, faith and grace alone, and certainly not to the glory of God alone. And so I wanted to spend the next few weeks looking at some of these issues to be aware of. Because it is important for us as believers to stay grounded on the foundation of Scripture. So that when we are faced with something questionable, you know, something that comes up, whether it's on a Sunday morning, whether it's an individual you follow on a podcast or YouTube, and there's something about, say, that doesn't quite sit right. You know, there's, there's something there, and I want, to, I want to figure out what it is. And it's okay to question it is okay to verify what they say. It's, it's okay to even verify 
is what AJ's saying biblical. I want you to do that. Look up. Okay, he references verse. Is it really pertaining to this matter? Is it in its context? It's okay, and you should. I encourage you to verify or even refute claims that you hear, such as one I heard this past week um, that just knew right out the gate that there's nothing biblical about that, but if you say it in the right way, then it, it flows well, and people are like, well, because they said it, that must be true. But we use Scripture as that foundation, and we verify, or we refute things that we hear based on the Word of God, because there are a lot of unbiblical heresy that we need to be aware of that Again, it's so easy just because people say it because it's part of church history for years that, well, I don't think that's the case, but because they said it, it must be true. But if we look at everything through the lens of Scripture, again, we get validation. We are able to dispute those teachings, those doctrines that we come across. And this approach helps us to avoid, you know, not just simply bad theology, but again, heresy, things that are against Scripture, anti biblical anti-christ and so for the next few weeks we're going to look at some specific issues some that maybe you've heard of some maybe say well i didn't even know that was an issue or a doctrine that's that's taught and none of these are necessarily foundational issues but they again begin off center off of its foundation and then continue off instead of bringing it back bringing it back to Christ alone, Scripture alone, all to the glory of God alone, they continue to veer off through years, through tradition, and through various different pastors propagating it to the point where, again, people don't even realize that it's not biblical. One of the, the issues that, while you may not know the name when I say it, you might say, I've heard this principle in action, or I've, I've heard people use this as an argument. I've, I've had people come to me with an underlying aspect of this doctrine. And so the first one I want to talk about is ret, uh, retributive. Um, you know, I wanted to say you know, retributive. I, I, had to, you know, I was like, how do I even pronounce this? Ret, retributive theology. Retributive, however you want to say it. But it's all about this aspect of retribution, like the getting, some would say, an aspect of vengeance or getting what you deserve. Some have turned it into various understandings of, you know, getting revenge because that is, again, we brought it on to ourselves. But within theology, retributive theology is the belief that God rewards good behavior and punishes evil behavior in a direct way proportional way in our earthly lives and you may be saying well isn't that the truth well we're going to break it down and look at it because there's aspects that were taken from scripture and twisted to fit you know our man-made thinking but in this retributive theology the framework they say that human actions directly result in specific blessings or curses from god is very much, as you've heard me refer to before, this mindset of God is the, the grand master over this giant chessboard called life, and he's moving us because we're nothing more than pawns on this board played as earth. But this theology, retributive theology, is often linked to this idea of divine justice. In other words, good people are blessed, sinful people suffer as a consequence of their actions. And again, right offhand, you say, well, that is true. God does promise blessings. And yes, he does promise blessings in Scripture. But the issue that arises with retributive theology is that their mindset is that there is always a direct correlation between good behavior and blessings or bad behaviors and immediate punishment. And that does open the door for some sticky theology. Because then when questions are asked, we don't have anybody to blame except, well, I brought this on myself. When that is not always the case, just look at what's happening to individuals and families in Asheville and the surrounding areas. Under retributive theology say, well, obviously they did something to deserve that. That is their punishment. You say that's extreme, but I've heard a university president 
say that when Katrina hit, that it was obviously because of New Orleans and New Orleans sin, instead of taking into account that we live into a fallen world where bad things happen to both good and bad people. Because if you hold strictly and firmly to retributive theology, the questions are unable to answer when they say, well, why do bad things happen to good Christians? A, I know a believer who's you know, a true disciple of Christ. Yes, they know they're not perfect, but they strive to grow in Christ, and yet they just were diagnosed with cancer. They just lost a child. They just lost their house. They, all of these things, bad things happen. And so under retributive theology, this mindset, those who hold firmly to it are going to say, well, obviously you're hiding something because you're getting what you deserved. But then you look and say, well, if that's the case, why do good things and blessings happen to what you can rightfully and honestly say are morally evil people? Again, it doesn't make sense. It's the question of suffering. Very, you know, the question we dealt with in our heavy series, the the question of why, God? Why is this world broken? Why do we suffer? Why is it the way it is? And so we have to be careful jumping on this bandwagon because some elements do fit with the blessings that God promised it. Just yesterday at a wedding, I, I pointed out God's blessing on a couple that is devoted as a married couple to God and the blessings that flow from that. But that doesn't mean there's never going to be arguments. That doesn't mean everything's going to go their way, that their children are always going to be healthy. But rather than understanding that within that blessing, there is peace, there is comfort, even amidst the pain and suffering of this life. And so we have to grasp this entire mindset as a whole instead of picking out the pieces we like. And when we run into a roadblock, just say, I can't answer it, but let's just ignore it. So what are, what are the key features of retributive theology? Again, it's the mindset that good deeds lead to blessings while sinful actions lead to suffering and punishment. And they would say it is always a clear and immediate way. In other words, it is the Christianized version of karma. It's this mindset that you brought it on yourself, whether good or bad, you're getting what you deserve. Let's forget about grace where the entire premise of the gospel is that I'm not getting what I deserve because of Jesus Christ. I've extended grace that I could never earn. Given the, the, the gifts of faith, the gift of grace, the extension of God's mercy, I do not deserve that. None of us do. So this Christian version of karma is twisting, distorting the mindset of grace and saying that it is always immediate. It is always clear if you mess up. This is the diagnosis. If you mess up, here's your financial struggles. If you mess up, there goes your relationship. All of it correlating specifically to this, you reap what you sow immediately in this life. And they would go on to say that the rewards or their punishment are understood as happening within our earthly life. They're not taking into account eternal blessings, eternal curses. They're focusing on not simple final judgment. But if I mess up today, then today I will deal with those consequences immediately. But I can counterbalance that by being good enough. Again, it's that, that mindset of keeping the, the scales weighed properly. But it is it's grounded in the idea that, yes, God is just and he does just distribute rewards. He also promises ultimate judgment in the end, but it is again, pushing grace out of the way and twisting this mindset of already because of the gospel and because of Jesus Christ, he took what I deserve, giving me what I don't deserve, which is an eternity with him. But again, it's saying the, on the extreme side, if you get cancer, it's a sign that God is punishing you for something bad you've done. Or if your business propers, it's a sign that God is pleased with you. This really is an overly simplistic interpretation of events that makes assumptions about God's intentions in our lives. But then again, the issue is, well, this person isn't a Christian, whether it's 
a, an athlete that's a multimillionaire, a singer that's a multimillionaire, does everything in opposition to the gospel and to Christ. And when a Christian hears retributive theology, they say, well, I'm far from their supposed blessings in this world. And you're telling me that it is a continual give and take that I'm being punished for something, whereas they are not when I'm striving to live my life for Christ, and you know, not just in a financial way, but through little elements. You, you get this understanding of vic- making ourselves out to be the victim, blaming ourselves because we don't have an answer for why things happen. And it is hard in the midst of pain and suffering. But the arguments that try to support retributive theology this kind of thinking ignore the myriad of instances in the bible where god uses suffering not to punish an individual but to but to bring out tremendous good throughout that person's life that may be years down the road look at the story of joseph and his brothers his brothers hurled him into a pit a well and then sold their own brother into slavery like we're never gonna have to deal with him again. He's, he's spoiled rotten. Our daddy loves him more than he does us. He's special. And so we're going to fake his death. We're going to cover his robe in blood, his, you know, this special robe that dad gave him. We're going to you know, bring all this turmoil in our dad's life by pretending as if he died because we're never going to see him again. He's sold off into slavery. But yet, through all of that, that tremendous pain, that redemption, Rejection by his own family, God used that situation to raise him up one step at a time to eventually he was second in command under Pharaoh and how that opened the doors to save his very family, to save Israel during a, a drought and a horrible famine. And Joseph himself, as he, he reveals himself, it had been so much so long, his brothers didn't recognize him. And of course, why would we expect our brother that we sold off in the slavery to be in charge of these resources, this grain, just second under Pharaoh? How, you know, why would we expect to ever see him again? And yet, here he is. He reveals himself and he says, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. God used a horrible situation not to punish Joseph, but rather to bring out a blessing for all of Israel, not just Joseph's family, not just Joseph himself, and not just Israel, but Egypt as well. And God used a horrible situation to bring about good for his glory and our good to those who call on his name, those who live in a devoted life for Christ. Because we all know life does not always reflect the clear-cut, good people prosper bad people suffer principle. We know that is not how this world works. We see that many good believers, many what you would call a righteous person, experiences suffering. And then you see many wicked people in opposition to God that are thriving. They seem to have it all together. They have everything they could ever need, but yet spiritually they are empty. Well, the psalmist, this isn't new, this isn't 21st century. The psalmist Asaph wrestled with the wicked prosperity. All that he saw around him, he saw that these individuals living in opposition to God are thriving. They have everything, but yet look at Israel. These righteous individuals, these believers who have a strong, significant faith, they are suffering while this wicked man continues to prosper. He says in Psalm 73, 3, For I have envied the arrogant when I saw prosperity of the wicked. He saw how this was not playing out as you would assume. It's not playing out with the blessings and cursing curses that retributive theology was teaching. And yet, that's what the pharaohs were passing off as solid theology. But we all know the fact is that not all good people are rewarded with good things in this life. And I know the old argument back is, well, no one is good. Well, of course, that's not what we're saying. We all have sin. We all have errors. We all have areas to grow and work in through sanctification, letting Christ change us. But the issue is we say, I'm living the best that I can for the name of Christ, and yet 
all of these things happen, whether it's a diagnosis, financial problems, relationship problems, health issues, whatever it may be. And if we stick firm to retributive theology, then we say, well, obviously I'm missing something. I've done something because I brought this on myself. Because at the same time, not all wicked people receive punishment immediately. Or else we wouldn't have the same question the psalmist has in Psalm 94, 3. How long, Lord, will the wicked, how long will the wicked be jubilant? Again, just like Asaph, he saw they were extending these parties, having a grand life, the blessed life. And the psalmist is saying, how long will you withhold judgment on the wicked? And, you know, just looking at Israel's history, again, just look at King Ahab. He was known as, still known as, one of the wickedest kings ever to reign. Yet he was king for 22 years in Samaria. We see that story in 1 Kings 16. 22 years of luxury for this evil king. While all of the righteous Israelites around him were being persecuted, were being pushed aside, looked down on as nothing. And so we do, as humans, ask a lot of questions. We want to make sense of it. And a lot of the things with suffering and pain cannot be answered, cannot be understood in why these things happen. But the beauty as Christians is we say, while I know these things happen, while I know I'm not, I shouldn't turn myself into the victim because this world is broken, in all of it, I'm trusting in God that he can bring about his glory and our good, continuing to trust in him, continuing to lean into him, continue to rely on him, all while dealing with this fallen world. But again, there's questions that are hard to answer, and with those questions come a lot of offshoots of our theology, trying to encapsulate this in a, in a simple way when it is not a simple subject to try to encapsulate. Because we do come across verses where we say, well, the Bible does teach the concept of sowing and reaping and understanding that certain things in this life are because of a decision I made. And certain consequences are because of decisions someone else made. The consequence of an individual uh, drunk driving, more often than not, somebody else pays that consequence, sometimes with their lives. But sometimes for us, the decisions we make brings, brings a consequence here and now for us, but also for others because we do live in a broken world. But we see this, this idea of reaping and sowing. Paul says in Galatians, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. But in this verse, in, in the understanding of sowing and reaping, what's often overlooked is the eternal aspect of reaping and sowing. Again, the retributive theology saying it's now, it's immediate, not thinking about the eternal aspects of heavenly rewards or eternal damnation in hell and the cursing, curses that come with a neglect or a denial of Jesus Christ. You know, so we do understand biblically the concept of reaping and sowing. sowing. Scripture also highlights God's blessings on those who live for, for God just in the Old Testament. And this is the only instance that I know of that we are actually told to test God. You know, we are, as a whole, you don't test God. But here, through Malachi, he's saying, test me. He says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will, be, will not be room enough to store it. Again, this is the only instance that I can recall that I can see where God tells us to test him. This testing is in the context of proper sacrificial giving and the blessings that come from such a worshipful understanding of what it means to give to God sacrificially it is not a promise for all prosperity it is not a promise that if i give here then my bank account's gonna look like that that is not at all what it's saying but it's in the context of malachi where they were the people of israel were turning their back on god 
And Malachi says, oh, if I just shut the doors of the temple that no one can put on this fake facade of supposed worship. You know, where all you're doing is going through the motions. You're not worshiping me. You're not giving sacrificially. But if you would test me in this, if you would learn as my people to give as I've called you to live in a sacrificial way, you won't understand the blessings that come from a life of understanding what it means to give to God and give in a way that glorifies God, not brings pride unto self. So it's not this promise of prosperity if we give a little. It's understanding that God does bless that cheerful giver, that sacrificial giver, because we understand what we're giving to and why we're giving to the Lord. So we do understand that God highlights his blessings in Scripture. We also see in Scripture that God will take vengeance on evildoers someday. It doesn't mean it'll all be here and now. Micah 5.15 says, In anger and wrath I will execute vengeance on the nations that did not obey. And again, in the retributive theology mindset, it says it's immediate, it's now, but then we wouldn't have verses in Psalms that say, God, how much longer will you withhold judgment? And God is saying, in my time, I will bring an end to all things. In my time, I will bring judgment on the world. But until then, my grace is extended even to them until the point of their death. They can come to me. My mercy is extended to them. There's always the doors of grace and mercy through God. And yet, understanding that one day, there will be a retribution. There will be an, a calling to an account before God Almighty. Because we do know there is that final judgment. We not just see it, not only see it in Isaiah and Revelation, but we see it all throughout Scripture. But it's the understanding that while there is retribution, there is a giving an, an account, it is that future judgment. It's not saying every, every single thing here is going to be an immediate counteract to that good or that bad in our life. Because these aspects are not always immediate. Again, it's according to God's timeline. But whereas retributive theology is concerned with the rewards and the punishment, they say it's here and it's now. Therefore, whatever you're dealing with, you are the cause. You are the reason. You are why you are going through this struggle. And again, on the, the extreme side, they will look at the people in Asheville and Hendersonville and say, well, obviously, you guys brought this on yourself. Obviously, you as a city, you as a people did this because of your actions, because of the immediate retribution of how you're living your life. But again, it's this, what retributive theology does is it offers a simplistic understanding of how God's justice works. But it often fell short on the, the biblical depiction of divine justice, divine mercy. Because while there are biblical principles that link obedience to blessing and disobedience to consequences, the Bible also teaches that suffering, injustice, and prosperity are more complex and are not always tied to individual moral behavior. Yet it was a prevalent teaching in Jesus' day and throughout all of Israel's history. It was what the Pharisees would push and promote. In fact, they would argue that any sickness or loss was due to personal sin, or as they would call it, sins of the Father. What you did in your life is now being played out in the life of your children and grandchildren. So when Israel came across an individual who was deformed, diseased, or any other illness, they would say it is because of sin directly. Not taking into account the fallenness of this world, but this deformity, this blindness, this deafness, whatever this diagnosis is, is because there is guilt, there is sin. But again, this was an incorrect oversimplification of the intricacies of this life and the fallen state that we live in. And while we may not say those parts out loud as the Pharisees did, there are still cases in modern day, where it does resemble prosperity gospel teachings. And we'll get into that next week. But 
They claim that God is going to reward faithfulness with material wealth and health. And in fact, God wants to do all of this if you, again, fill out all the check marks, do all the right things. And of course, if you're punished with that diagnosis or those financial struggles because God wants you to be rich, this is what's going to happen. It's going to be poverty or illness. So while they won't say the, the silent part out loud that, well, that deformity is because of your own guilt, there is that teaching that comes that God wants you to be healthy and wealthy. When God doesn't promise that this life is going to always be one of health and wealth. So this distorted view does lead to blaming their, those victims for their own misfortune. Or it, it assumes that success is a, always a sign of divine favor. It can be, but it's not always the case. Because it fails to answer the question of suffering in the world because it's always looking to blame that individual instead of seeking ways to serve and help that individual. The Pharisees, again, were the same way. They looked to the blessings and curses attached to the Mosaic law, and they said, well, this is your proof for retribution, retributive theology. We see this in Deuteronomy. To Israel, I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, to keep his commands, decrees, and laws. Then you will live and increase, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away and you are not obedient, if you are drawn away to bow down to other gods and worship them, I declare to you this day that you will certainly be destroyed. So we do see elements under the Mosaic law, under Israel's theocracy, that God is saying, if you continue to live as I've commanded you, there will be blessings as a people. Doesn't mean everybody's going to be healthy. Doesn't mean there's never going to be a death. But Israel as a nation, as a people, will be prosperous, will continue to grow, will be continually you know, taken care of, whether as we saw with the manna or through the water from the rock. In little ways, by pursuing God, there are blessings among the people. But disobedience did bring retribution. Like the instance of Numbers eleven thirty three, it fell quickly and immediately. But sometimes it was not so quickly. It was not an immediate retribution. We can see again just the up and down throughout the book of Judges for Israel's history. But we see that God was continuously warning Israel to stay devoted to him. And through obedience, there would be, as a nation, prosperity and growth. But it didn't mean complete health and wealth for every Israelite. It was blessing on the nation. And this treatment of Israel, this promise to Israel under the law of Moses, is not the basis of our theology in Christ under the new covenant. We can't pretend or assume all of that was for Israel is now for us. While we do understand there's blessing and cursing in this world, we also understand that because of the fallen nature of this world, there's some things that we just won't fully know and can't fathom why they are part of this world. But we know God is coming back to redeem his people and his creation. So they would look to the Mosaic law as a proof, twisting blessing and cursing to mean, again, any deformity, any disease, obviously was from sin and guilt. They'd also look to Proverbs for proof where many Proverbs seem to pr promise good things for the righteous, bad things for the wicked. Just two examples. It says, The Lord's curse is on the house of the wicked, but he blesses the home of the righteous. The righteous eat to their heart's content, but the stomach of the wicked goes hungry. What we need to remember about the nature of Proverbs is that Proverbs are not promises. Rather, they are general truths about life. It's giving us a guide for wisdom and godly living, showing us that, generally speaking, making wise choices, godly choices, brings better results, better blessings than foolish, unwise choices. Living godly lives has a practical, temporal benefit in addition to the eternal benefits. But it is not a way to validate retributive theology in every single instance. But it is pushing us 
towards godly living, pushing us towards wisdom. We can't take these individual verses as an ultimate promise that I can counterbalance the fallenness of this world through every single good thing I do because this world is fallen and sometimes we have to deal with the consequences of other people. And we can look at that and understand because, again, the myriad of examples of godly individuals in Scripture who did experience pain, did experience suffering, such as Daniel, a godly man, was thrown into the den of lions. Or in Jeremiah, the godly man lowered into a, a mud pit. Or we see in the, the New Testament, Paul was shipwrecked trying to preach the gospel. And while he was on the island of Malta, he was bit by a viper. And we saw retribution theology through those on the island. They say he must be demon-possessed. That's why the viper bit him. But that opened the door for the gospel. That opened the door for Jesus Christ among the people of Malta. But again, the people say, well, obviously you did something wrong. You were shipwrecked. You had to swim to shore, and then you were bit by a viper. You've done something wrong when this man was trying to preach the gospel of Christ. And we see over and over again, godly individuals suffered due to the fallen nature of this world, not because of any retribution. You know, we see it all summed up in Solomon's words in Ecclesiastes 9.11 said, again, I saw that under the sun, the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise, nor riches to the intelligent, nor favor to those with knowledge. But time and chance happen to them all. This world is fallen, and we all experience aspects of it. While different, we all understand the fallen nature of this world. R.C. Sproul said, suffering is intrinsically related to the fallenness of this world. And so we cannot conclude that through the use of Scripture that an individual's suffering in this world is direct proportion to that individual's sin. But yet it was prevalent then and it's prevalent today. It is a pervasive theology that we hear played out time and time again. Again, Jesus himself was confronted with retributive theology in John 9. In fact, his disciples displayed this understanding. They saw a man born blind. They asked, who sinned? This man or his parents? Why, is he, why was he born blind? Because it must have been his parents' sin because he was an infant. You know, who sinned? Who brought this on this man that he is now blind from birth? And again, this, this shows the underlying belief in retribution theology. Somebody sinned along the way. His parents, his grandparents, he's paying for somebody's guilt, somebody's sin, somebody's wrongdoing. But Jesus quashes that, that notion, said neither this man nor his parents sin. Not saying they were perfect. He's saying it was not sin that caused this blindness. But rather God had purpose in this man's blindness beyond punishing sin. This blindness opened the doors for a miracle. And not just a miracle of sight, but a miracle much bigger than restoring this man to sight for the first time. He tells us, tells his disciples that his blindness was not the result of sin, not the result of his parents' wrongdoings, but so that the works of God might be displayed in and through him because of Jesus Christ. So again, already in the gospel, Jesus pushes retributive theology out the window when his own disciples showed an underlying belief in that theology that the Pharisees were teaching. We see it also in Luke 13. Jesus warns against assuming that people who suffer calamities are worse sinners than others. Again, he, he goes on and says, Those 18 who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them, do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you no. But then he opens the doors to an understanding of, how fragile this life is. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. And so it was a common word you know, through, through the grapevine, the gossip circles, that obviously these people who died in this local calamity, this, this horrible accident as a tower fell in Siloam, he's telling them, while many of you are saying, and even Pharisees might be saying it, 
the tower didn't fall on these people because of God's retribution, because they were more sinful than other people in Jerusalem. Rather, through that understanding of the fragility of life, that all of our cars can be called in a horrific accident like that. Before we know it, we're, we're gone from this world. He's saying, but now repent while you have the time. You know, he's countering retributive theology, but he's also opening the doors through grace and love for the call to repentance, coming to him, clinging, clinging on to God because this life is fragile, because accidents do happen. And so he's reminding us all the importance of repentance and turning to him because bad things do happen in this world. And it's not because of any retribution on behalf of God that such a calamity would occur. So we see it in the gospel. But the greatest argument against it is the book of Job, where Job's friend come to him with their retributive theology. Obviously, Job, you did something wrong. That's why you've lost everything. That's why you have sores all over your body. That's why you're in this lowest of low moments. They assume that this is divine punishment. This is something you've hidden from us, but God knows you can't hide from him. But this story of Job challenges retributive theology because Job is described as righteous, yet he suffers more than anybody we can we can think of in all that he experienced, this incredible loss and suffering. But his suffering was not linked to sin. It was not because of retribution. But of course, when Job's friend came to speak to him, in his misery, they bring their retributive theology to him. We see Eliphaz simplistically concludes that, you know, we see a time and time again where the wicked perish. So Job, are you wicked? You must be. And then Bildad and Zophar echo the same sentiments. They're not any help to Job. They're saying, what did you do to bring this on yourself? You're suffering, and because you're suffering, I know good and well you're hiding something from us. But all three of Job's friends were wrong about Job and wrong about God. Job 42, 7, it tells us, The Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, My anger burns against you and against your two friends. For you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. Job is speaking the truth. These men were blasting off bad theology, bringing no help to Job in his misery. And this entire story teaches that suffering is not always a direct result of personal sin. And that God's purposes are often beyond our understanding. So this attempt to make a sense of suffering through retributive theology oversimplifies the complexity of God's sovereign will alongside man's fallen nature. Because we know we live in a broken world with broken people that make bad decisions. But our God is sovereign and will one day bring judgment to this world. We'll one day all stand before that righteous judge. And we know that retribution is coming. But until that day, we have to be careful not to assume God's blessing or God's judgment on individuals based on the eternal circumstances that we look to, that we understand is coming. Instead, we trust the judge. We trust in our Savior. Because retributive theology cannot adequately explain the suffering of the innocent. You know, those afflicted by natural disasters or children that we know suffer. If suffering is always seen as a result of sin, it brings the troubling implication that victims of justice and suffering deserve their fate. They've brought this on themselves. And this, of course, leads to victim blaming, where individuals are unjustly held accountable for event, events beyond their control. Because this theology is at odds with the concept of divine grace. God's favor is not earned through merit or good works. Grace challenges the strict quid pro quo thinking of retributive theology, suggesting that God's relationship with humanity is, is transactional. But it's rather, we have to understand, it's rooted in unconditional love. We all understand suffering. We all dealt with suffering. But we see it in a world that points us to God, not blaming you know, him not trying to find a reason for every single thing, but trusting in him and his sovereign plan 
trusting in his redemption. Because we have hope that's beyond this world. In our darkest moments, we have hope for that eternity. We have hope in the judge and in our Savior. That's where our focus goes. That's where the glory goes. All pointing back to him. All trusting more in him no matter what comes our way. Let's pray. Hey guys, it's AJ Layton, lead pastor at Access Point Church. We're so glad you guys have found us, stumbled upon us, or have been long listeners. If you like what you hear, please subscribe to our page, share with your friends. We look forward to seeing you next week.